Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to do another exploration video. It's been a while since we got to do one of those. I'm going to show you a storeroom back aft, and we're going to talk about some of the interesting structural elements here. Prior to World War II, armor tended to be something that was just bolted onto the side of the ship. You don't use armor as a structural element. However, with the interwar naval treaties, in order to save weight, a couple of countries started to pioneer with using armor as a structural element without having a backing plate. And uh, among some other framing and other interesting things here, we're going to see one of the uh, uses of armor as a structural element on an Iowa-class battleship while we're down here. So for those of you following at home, we are currently in, uh, on fourth deck at frame 196.2. So we're on the port side of the ship and uh, we're in a trunk directly beneath the ship's brig. And uh, this trunk has two doors in it. This one leading to a CHT holding tank, which was added later in the ship's career uh, that we'll talk about in a future video. Yeah, so it's, it's one of the sewage tanks of the ship. And this door opens to a former a storeroom, which I suspect this was until it was turned into a sewage tank in, in 82. Um, so this room is where we're going to explore and uh, check out some of the stuff here. This is really one of those spaces that's built into any nook and cranny you have left that uh, otherwise isn't particularly usable. All right, so let's go check it out. Uh, first off, this door it looks like there was originally a cage door here and they pop riveted sheet metal over it. Uh, and you can see they doubled up on lock. So there's probably an original here and an eighties edition here for whatever reason. Um, so inside this space, you can see the original expanded metal uh, that was used to block this space off. And uh, you can see that at some point they decided that they didn't want anyone from the crew to even be able to see in here, so they covered it over. I guess they're trying to remove temptation. Um, who knows, that might have been an 80s thing, it might have been a Vietnam era thing, uh, hard to say. So some other features you see in here, like other storerooms, we've got the aluminum uh, stanchions here and the mounting points in both the deck and the overhead for them. And uh, you can see that there's a lot of wastewater uh, piping in the overhead, which would all be 80s additions, getting the waste down here to the uh, CHT tanks. You can see there's a number of stanchions here supporting the deck above us, and you can see some really interesting framing here. We're at frame 200 right now uh, that is supporting the structure of the ship above us. You remember that uh, frame spacing on a battleship is every four feet, but you see that there's also half frames in between. So we got frame 99, and then we've got another structural element here, frame 200. So as the ship starts to curve back here, there's a lot more framing happening. Uh, you're gonna see a lot of stuff that's been stripped off of other ships just laying on the deck here. We've got some old uh, dehumidification piping here from uh, when that was being used, some sinks that were stripped off of other ships. And then as we come around here, we get to see some cool things. If you watched this video, link in the description below, about the aviation fuel storeroom, you will remember that as we were going down those trunks, there were lights that were recessed into the wall so that if something happened to those uh, incandescent bulbs and they uh, broke and something could arc and light a, a fume, they were all recessed and sealed over. And so right now we've got fluorescent bulbs in there to last a while, but when the ship was built, these were intended for incandescent bulbs. If something happened and that bulb broke, you turn on the lights and there's still an arc between the, uh, the wires in there that could set off any fumes that might be in this space. And as, as you can tell already, fire is a huge concern with where this fuel is stored particularly with sparks from the fumes. So this being inside of a pressurized, sealed 
airtight porthole of its own, uh, all but guarantees that that can't be busted. Uh, so going down there, we were wondering how the heck do you even uh, change a light bulb there? Well, this is us on the other side of the bulkhead, and here is the wiring and the uh, access point to those recessed lights. Another cool feature down here is this bulkhead 204 tag, which is probably an original feature from when the ship was first built. Doesn't look like the tags they added in the 80s. Uh, you can also possibly hear a sloshing sound. We are right at the waterline and it is apparently a windy day. Uh, so you can hear a sloshing sound. Normally, if the ship was fully loaded, if this space was full of stuff, uh, then the waterline would be about midway up third deck above us. But right now, with the ship lightly loaded, we're on fourth deck and the waterline is um, probably about midway down this deck, which we can hear. And finally, that brings us to the weird angled wall here. We are on the outside of after steering. So there's a video link in the description below where we go down and explore the after steering spaces. Uh, and, and this is the outside of that. So it does not extend all the way to the outside of the ship. It is a separate armored box inside of the vessel. Uh, this armor is similar to the armored belt of the ship. Uh, it, it's class A armor. However, it's a little bit thicker. Where our regular belt is 12.1 inches thick um, with a six inch deck overhead, the box around after steering is 13 inches thick with a seven inch deck overhead. Uh, and where our armored belt is mounted onto a backing bulkhead, this armor is not. It is completely freestanding structurally. So here you can see where the side armor and the bulkhead armor are joined by this riveted plate. You do not weld on class A armor plate. You can drill holes in it and then you can rivet the plates together like this. The reason you don't weld on this stuff is because it has been face hardened. So the outer, the top 20%, the 20% on the strike face of the armor is heated up. Uh, that puts more carbon into it. That makes it more brittle. That means that it's harder and more likely to shatter an incoming projectile, but because it's so brittle, it's likely to shatter itself. So the back 80% of the plate is still left as soft armor, basically the same as class B, which means that it has some give. So if you add more heat to this, you're heating it up more, it might heat deeper into the plate and make it brittle so that when it's hit by a shell, instead of shattering the shell, the armor shatters and something is able to punch through. Now, the interesting thing about this particular plate is that the Navy knew they were using it structurally, so they did not face harden the top and bottom edges of it, which in theory meant they could still weld. And uh, if you look at the top edge here, you'll notice that you've got texture, texture, texture from casting the armor over this whole thing. And the top about an inch is incredibly smooth. And that's where they've welded the deck above it. So uh, here is a deck beam for the deck above us, keeping it structurally sound. And look at how they tried to weld it here to the top of the armor but you notice that that weld is completely broken off. They, they didn't use the right rod to weld the armor, so it just didn't take. So, so that's really not doing anything there. Now check this out. You can get the knife under the weld bead in the armor. So that, that's really cool. You'll notice over here, they riveted just probably a regular mild steel plate onto this, and then they welded this bulkhead onto the riveting, not onto the armor. Likewise, on the bottom, they installed this uh, caulk seam here with the gusset plate here. And you notice how there's a built up weld bead on it. So it's not just one bead. They put a bead around and they put two beads over that, three beads over that, uh, so that they have a large welded surface area. 
this one right here where the paint's peeling off, you can see the various beads. It looks like they've got four beads on there. And you'll notice because that plate is scalloped, it gives them something like two or three times as much surface area to weld to as if it was just a straight line, you're dropping one bead there. So now you're doing this instead. So that makes it much stronger, which is important because this is structural plate. So this is part of what's holding this vertical here. Uh, remember, World War II welding is a relatively new technique. So the US Navy really goes all out in uh, machining these gusset plates to be scalloped so they can have as much welded surface area as possible because uh, they just don't trust it as much as the older proven riveted technology, even though it's saving weight. Another interesting feature here, you can see that a manhole has been blanked over. There's another identical space on that side of the compartment that's also used for storage. Um, interestingly, if we were to go over there, you would see that there are no lighted res uh, recesses. The reason for that is as built, aviation storage back in the uh, JP-5 tanks that we climbed down earlier had four separate drums in it. In the 1980s, they decided, well, that's ridiculous. Uh, so they added a bulkhead down the middle of that space. They deleted the two starboard side drums entirely and just turned the entire room into fuel storage. On the port side, they didn't do that because all the pumps were in that space. So they couldn't just fill it up. Um, they, they need to be able to access those motors to do work. So the original World War II tanks are in that side of the space. The other side was entirely turned into a tank. So now we're in the mirrored space on the starboard side of the ship, which is pretty much the same. This space was used as a clothing storeroom. So you'll notice there aren't the bases in the deck for the racks, uh, but there are all sorts of brackets welded in the overhead, and these are definitely 80s additions. They cut out whatever was uh, storage racks were here, and they replaced it with these so they could hang uniforms in here to be issued. Um, otherwise, things are largely the same. There's a shelf built on this side. Any of you guys who've worked retail know you need flat space to fold clothing. Here, uh, you can see that they have blanked over where those enclosed lights were. And over here is a cool feature. I suspect they built this side of the ship before that side. Here you can see they tried repeatedly to weld this frame onto the armor uh, and they, it didn't work. So they eventually they just cut it off. Uh, and on the other side, you see that these frames are already cut by the time they're installed. Notice, though, that the frame that's welded to the riveted plate here was able to weld fine. Another interesting addition uh, over here is you can see that they were still using the space until right up until the ship was decommissioned. And uh, some of the last crew members in here decided that they needed a power outlet uh, and a fan mounted in here for when they were doing their work. And they drew where they were going to be, where the, where the mounting points were, and it never got wired up or installed. Uh, so th that's another interesting feature that maybe decommissioning the ship was a surprise to some people. Or maybe they asked for this stuff months and months and years ago, and it, just never got done. So people ask me pretty frequently, Ryan, how do you know all this obscure stuff about these weird places in the ship? Um, sometimes I know about it because I've talked to a sailor who worked here. I, I've not found any sailors who work down here in clothing issue though. Um, the, the weird stuff that I can notice in this space is because of John Miano's book, which is a pictorial guide to Battleship New Jersey. And uh, this book is one, we've showed it a couple times on the channel. It is still in production. Uh, he is hoping to get it out by uh, December in time for Christmas. Uh, we will definitely carry it in the museum's gift shop. But uh, John's book, last time you saw it, I had a pre-production copy that I was editing. That has gone back to him. Uh, 
he's since been on board a couple times again, including one time when we came down and looked through these spaces and the structural elements that make it up. So much of the information I talked about in today's video, I learned from working with John. Uh, so be sure to keep an eye out. We will be sure to announce when his book is released. So we, we don't have all the information at this time. The, the final draft has gone to the publisher. Not sure when the, the books will be in hand, but I left an email address in the description below. If you send us your email address, you send us a message on there, uh, we will add you to a mailing list so that as soon as we get copies of the book in hand, we can reach out to you and uh, then you can hopefully have them in hand by Christmas. The final interesting feature I'll point out in this space is something we've talked about before, uh, but you'll notice there are orange arrows all over this space that are taped on. These were made uh, when the ship was in mothballs from 91 to 99 and installed so that the guys inspecting the ship who, who don't know the ship can always find their way out. Uh, and you can't really tell now because the lights are on, but a mothballed ship might not have lights in all the spaces. There might not be full power when they're doing these inspections periodically, uh, but the arrows are reflective. So if you hit it with your flashlight, uh, it, it will shine and, and you can see your way out. So it's interesting to me that this is one of the spaces that they plan to inspect. I guess it makes sense since we've got our shell plating right here. And if we develop the leak, uh, back here, it's significantly thinner than around the rest of the ship. The bow on the stern has, has the thinnest shell plating, drops down to about a half an inch. Uh, so here at the waterline, at the extreme ends of the ship is where the leaks would occur. Uh, so this was on their list. So this space was used as a storage space because what else can you use it for with all the weird angles and stuff? Do you have any similar spaces in your house at home? Let us know in the comment section down below. In my house, we store a lot of stuff under the steps. Um, that's where we store our little wizard boy and a lot of our food. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other uh, sources, including businesses and individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support you guys have given us. There's a link in the description below uh, that allows you to donate to the museum if you'd like to support us and our channel. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so that more people find out about us and what we're doing. Thanks for watching.